We're going to continue our series. We've been doing a summer, summer in the Psalms the last several weeks, and uh, we're going to continue that. We've got like three more weeks. Um, this week, we're going to look at Psalm chapter 46, and we're going to talk about finding stability in the midst of chaos. Really has no effect on us, right? I mean, there's, there's nothing chaotic uh, right now. Uh, but it's about finding stability in the midst of chaos. The truth is, there are moments in life where things don't make sense, where bad things happen to good people, where things just seem out of our control. Can you relate to that? I'm sure many of you have been there, and if you haven't, you will be. It's inevitable, it's life. It's during those times that we question and we wonder about life and we wonder about faith. What part does it play? What does it mean? Does it make any difference? It's also during these times that we ask, what should I do when so much of this is out of my control? And yet so much has a powerful impact and effect on me. So it's not that these things just happen, it's that they happen and they impact us. So what do we do? Does faith have a voice in the midst of these moments? The psalmist declares, yes. Yes, faith has a voice. And I want you to hear this voice today as it's spoken out of Psalm 46, and I'm going to read it for you. And it's powerful, so just listen as I read. He says, God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter, he utters his voice, and the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow, he shatters the spear, and he burns the chariots with fire. Then those all familiar verses. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Today we're going to look through this passage and we're going to realize a few truths that exist in our world, that exist within faith, that relate to all of us. And the first thing that the psalmist does is he gives us a picture. He gives us a picture of complete chaos. How many of you love chaos? You just love when everything's spinning out of control. You go, that's what I long for. <laughs> Nobody likes chaos. We don't like that. We like order. We like stability. But here's a, a picture of chaos. You have the mountains crashing into the sea. You have the, everything's trembling. You have the, the, every, the, the, the uh, waters are foam, foaming because they're roaring. Have you ever seen a flood? You ever been a part of a flood where you see these natural disasters, whether it's a flood, you've been a part of a hurricane, you've seen um, an earthquake, you've experienced these things. This is the picture the psalmist gives. It's a complete meltdown. It's, everything is out of control. The one thing you notice with all these natural disasters is they're out of your control. You can try to guide the water, but you can't control it. 
That wind you have no control over. You're just trying to survive. You've been in those moments where these things are true. But this is a picture of devastation, a complete meltdown. But what I want you to see is also a picture. The psalmist is giving this understanding that it's a picture that everything in our humanity is being shaken unstabilized, destroyed. You've heard people use these words. I feel like my, my world is crashing down or caving in. Most of us, at one point or another, have probably said that. We've experienced that. That something is out of our control and it just feels like everything is crumbling. And that's the picture he gives. It's all being shaken. But it's not just all of these natural disasters. What he's doing is he's giving a picture that relates to us in life. It's a picture that every human foundation, every human foundation is being shaken. Think about these foundations. Our financial foundations. Our health foundations. Our vocational foundations, our relational foundations, all of these foundations are being shaken. We feel that. We've had moments where that's been true. So what do you do when all of those things are shaking and it feels like your world is caving in? For some, it's panic. For some, it's fear. For some, it's anxiety. Fortunately, for Christians, we call it concern. We have our own dictionary. You know, I'm just really concerned. No, you're fearful and anxious. <laughs> and so when we get to these points, the, the psalmist wants us to feel this. He wants to see it. He wants us to understand that there are moments in life that are out of your control. Where everything is being shaken that once felt stable. You want to look at a world that feels unstable? You're living in it. I wonder what the future holds. And I don't know. And if there was ever a message that related to current society, it's this one. Because there's so much out of our control. Then he gives another picture. Aren't you glad that the psalm didn't end there? It's like, okay, let's pray and see you next week. Um, man, God be with you. No, it's, he gives this other picture, and this is the picture of peace and security. I want you to look at verses 1 and 2. We're going to work our way down through the passage, but verses 1 and 2. What amazing verses. He uses a couple words here I want to highlight. He says, God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. God is our refuge and strength. Refuge means a place of safety in time of danger. Present help is talking about help has been found. It's not far away. It's been found. I was thinking about this as I was going through this passage, and it took me back to a time in our family where, you know, you're enjoying moments. You're enjoying experiences together. And so we went to Emerson Park for the 4th of July. July fireworks. How many have ever been to Emerson Park for the fireworks? I'm sure many have. Thousands of people. Thousands of people. And what you do is, you know, good families, well, we, we take our blankets, we lay them down, you're playing frisbee, you have food, you've got all of this stuff, and man, we're just living this beautiful experience. Started to get dark. We all lay down on our blankets and we look up into the sky because the fireworks display is about to begin. Wasn't long after it began and 
My daughter yells. She starts yelling in pain. And I say, honey, what's wrong? What, what's going on? Are, are you all right? And she's like, ah, oh, my eye, my eye. Oh, yeah. You know, and just start crying and yelling and just horrific sounds coming out. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, she's, there's something wrong. I picked up my daughter in my hands, and I started running with her. Because I remembered when we walked in, there was an EMT station. I remember seeing that, and I began running through the crowd. I didn't care who was there. I didn't care how far it was. I grabbed her, and I began running for all I could to that place. And I just started yelling, we need help. We need help. And just grabbed her and took her. And they saw me and they heard me. And they grabbed her and they laid her down. And they began to flush her eye. And they realized it was worse. There was something else going on. And so they took her in the ambulance. They took her to the hospital. And they determined that one of the embers from the fireworks went into her eye. You know the one in a million? If I'm going to use that, I want to use it for the lottery. <laughs> you know, the one in a million. But no, we were the one in a million. You're looking up, having a family moment, and all this happens. And I'm here to tell you what I needed in that moment was help. I was longing to see a face that said, bring her over here. We've got her. And when I saw that, I, I couldn't do anything. I was just observing. I was just watching. But I felt like there was somebody cared enough and they were competent enough to help in my time of need. And this is the picture. He says that we have this earth is, is, is shaking and there's all of this instability. And the mountains are crashing into the sea. And he says there's help that can be found. There's help that can be found. It's important that we recognize that. that. It says that God is our place of safety in time of danger, that he is our present help. It's interesting that he doesn't say that he's just our help. He says he's our help now. He is there for us. Isn't that awesome? Help can be found. Then he uses this phrase, and I, I find it to be just beautiful. It's in verse 4. He's talking about all this turmoil, and then he, he says this statement. There is a river. There is a river whose stream makes glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. There is a river. In the midst of all of this instability, he talks about this river. This river is a place where it says that God is in the midst of her, that there is this, this uh, place of peace and provision. In ancient times, cities were built along rivers. Why? Because you needed water. The unique thing about Jerusalem is it, had, it wasn't built on a river. There's no river near it. And so what most people didn't know is during King Hezekiah's reign, he had them do an underground tunnel to Gihon, the spring of Gihon, to allow water to come to the pool of Siloam inside of Jerusalem. So they always had water. It was their provision. They, in the midst of a siege, what people did, and they believed, oh, well, Israel has no, Jerusalem has no water. We'll just keep them under siege for a while, and they'll have to surrender. What they didn't know is that God had provided a river. A river for their physical needs for their provisions, a river that would give them peace during that time of siege and attack. 
Then he goes on in verses 6 through 9, and I think this is important. I, I, I just want to speak into this a little bit. Look at verses 6 through 9. He says, the nations rage, the kingdoms totter, he utters his voice, and the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. He says, come behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow, he shatters the spear, he burns the chariots with fire. The phrase, come behold the works of the Lord. There have been moments where you look back and you say, well, God did great things then. Why is he doing great things now? It says he made wars to cease then. Why doesn't he cease the wars now? Where is this great God in our time of need? And what we see when we look back over the course of history, God doesn't always stop every war at the very beginning. There are wars that rage there were things that happened that seemed that he was completely out of control. Things were out of control. God, it appeared, was at a distance. And the truth is, when we get far enough back, we see where God was still in control of everything, allowed things for his purpose and his desire. And here we get this picture, this picture of God. That he's not cowering down, just protecting us. He's rising up. He says, come, remember. Remember the works of the Lord. Reflect on his power. And I've said this many times. God can change anything, anytime he wants. If he chooses not to, he has a, he has a greater purpose than solving what appears to be our problem. That maybe the greatest thing he does is not to make a war cease, but he changes a people. And sometimes changes a nation based on those things. But we need to remember the power that God possesses. That he's not just waiting for things to calm down as we are. Why? Because the truth is, everything in this world is out of our control. I'm a control freak. I don't know about you. I, I like to be in control. I don't like to be a passenger in a car. Uh, I don't like any of that. And the truth is, you know, in life, it doesn't take us too long to realize we're not in control. There's very little, if anything, that we're in control of. So how do we navigate this when the world is being shaken, when every human foundation is unstable? He calls us to a place of peace and rest. Look at verses 10 and 11. This is so cool. Verses 10 and 11, he says this. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Now, I may. It could happen. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress, our place of safety. So the call is this, in the midst of this incredible picture of complete chaos, of peace and security, he says this, stop allowing the world to dictate your response. Stop allowing the world to dictate your response. Stop allowing your emotions to dictate your response. Because then we just react and we're like any other person on the planet. And he says, you're different. God has made a difference in your life. And this is where it's seen. Stop allowing anxiety to dictate your emotions. Stop everything. Just stop and be still. Still so that you can see the greatness of God in the midst 
of all the chaos. In the midst of all the instability, you would see the one thing, the one thing that is stable, and that's God himself. The truth is, you may be able to still everything else. You may not be able to still everything else, but you can still yourself. I was thinking about this, you know, and you look back over church history and you see, um, you, you see a lot of the great heroes of the faith. God didn't exempt them from challenges, troubles, difficulties. Some of them in the Fox's Book of Martyrs, you see that they, a lot of them were martyred for their faith. They would even um, build fires around them and burn them in the stake. And I'm thinking about that. I'm like, Burning at the stake. I mean, where's the God of rescue there? Where did, did God not show up? Where's this all powerful, makes the wars to cease, and all of us? Where is he? And what you learn is as these individuals are being burned at the stake, something the world could never accomplish in that moment was not the fact that they embraced fear, but it's like, I believe it was John Huss that was singing as the flames started roar, roaring. That this is what I want you to hear. The peace that God gives is not stilling the storm. It's not stopping the chaos. It's not eliminating all the instability. It's knowing that peace... Peace is found inside you, not outside of you. The world is searching for peace. We have a cry politically for peace. We want peace to happen in our world, and I'm all for it. But the truth is, one place that God says peace can exist, and it's in your soul. It's in your heart. He says, not just be still, but know, know that I am God. Be confident in who he is, his word, his power, his provision, and trust him. Have a holy dependence and unwavering trust in who he is. It's awesome. So in the midst of all of it, in the midst of all the chaos, the hardest thing in the world is to be still. I'm trying to solve the problem. I'm trying to stop the wind. I'm trying to stop everything. And he goes, would you stop it? And just come before me and recognize the peace that I came to provide was not an external peace, but an internal peace. My friend, listen, when we get that, the world is searching for it. They go all over the world searching for peace. And God goes, I have come to provide it. God is the source of the peace people are looking for. John 14, 27 says these incredible words, and I'll close with these. He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Wow, Jesus is about ready to leave, and everybody's like, ah, Jesus, you're leaving. He says two things. I'm leaving my Holy Spirit to dwell within you, to empower you, to equip you for everything I've called you to, everything that I've purposed for your life. Spirit of God is going to work in you to accomplish he said, but there's another thing. I'm going to leave peace that the world can't possess, that they're searching for a peace that is not of this life, a peace that can only come from him. Only God can bring peace to our soul and our heart. He's the only one. And he says, that's the peace I come to give to you. But I want to... I want to just say something here because mm, this, is, this is important. 
people are looking for the peace of God, but you never can have the peace of God until you have peace with God. The truth is that God isn't just there with us, that sin has separated us from God, and it says that we are enemies because our sin has separated us from him. Jesus came to eliminate that, to bring forgiveness and restoration so that we could have peace with God. It doesn't happen from attending church, from giving in the offering, from doing good deeds. It comes from a point where we confess Jesus. Jesus, I have no hope without you that your death was a payment for my sin. Your resurrection was a reminder that you have the power to forgive me and the power to give life. And it's in you, Jesus, I trust. That's how you find peace with God. And then after that, then we ask for the peace of God. God, rule my heart. Don't let anxiety rule my heart. Man, I've been there. It's not good. Don't let fear rule my heart. I've been there. You don't want to be there. Don't let all of these things of this world, the instability, the shaking, rule your heart. Come to this point where you Quiet yourself before your creator and say, God, bring peace to my heart and my soul in the midst of the chaos. And you're going to experience something that no man can accomplish. Nobody in life can manufacture. Only the God who created you and Jesus who saved you can accomplish. And that's peace in your soul. Don't you love these psalms? Man, it's good. It's good. I, I'll tell you, it's, I've told many of you the stories of my life. I've got enough illustrations for three lifetimes. I've tried to share that with the Lord. said, I don't need any more. Um, but our life has been marked by all kinds of challenge, by the shakings whether it's health, whether it was financial, whether it was vocational, whether it was all kinds, there's shakings all over the place. And what he's allowed us as a couple and as a family to recognize is my job is not to stop the shakings externally, but to embrace the peace of God internally. And man, that's a process that oftentimes I'm there, not all the time. I've got to reorient my heart. And the call this morning is reorient your heart. Reorient your heart to embrace the peace of God in the midst of this instability.